Legion, it's Hadrian. Thank you for being here and welcome back to Strategy School and Civilization VI Rise and Fall. This video is going to cover era score, ages, including Dark Ages, Golden Ages, Heroic Ages, etc., as well as dedications in the Civilization VI expansion. This is, of course, a Rise and Fall specific topic. So if you are playing vanilla Civilization VI, a lot of what I'm about to talk about, if not all of what I'm about to talk about, does not apply to you. There are some things I'm going to cover right off the bat here that will apply, but the meat of this episode is specific to the Rise and Fall expansion and subsequent content after that. So a hallmark of the Civilization experience, even before this one and before 5 and before 4, and since the beginning really, has been the ability for civilizations to outpace one another in their technological and societal development. So you might have some civilizations that are farther along than others or some that don't quite some that haven't quite caught up with the normal pace of technological advancement. Another really exciting thing that can happen in civilization is you can have civilizations that outperform the development of our real-world society on Earth. So that's always an interesting kind of narrative thing that can develop when you're playing a game of Civilization VI, and it happens quite often, right? But vanilla Civilization VI, without rise and fall, very much allows this to occur organically. Civilizations on both the tech and the civic street just get ahead of and behind one another without any real fanfare or mechanics interwoven into that system. When you open your tech or your civic tree, you can even see a timeline at the bottom to kind of show you who is in what position. So of the known civilizations to us, we're pretty much on par with Frederick, and Cleopatra is slightly behind currently. Culture-wise, we're all three in the same spot. So that is true, that particular part right there, that was applicable to Vanilla Civ 6 and Rise and Fall. And that mechanic doesn't change in Rise and Fall. All of that is still true, but with a twist. Rise and Fall introduces the concept of a global age in which the world enters the eight ages of the Civilization 6 timeline in unison. You might remember at the end of the last episode, it literally said the world enters the classical age. While your individual progress through each tree, technology and civics, is unaffected, the combined progress of the world civilizations kind of works behind the scenes to create a countdown to the next age, which is where you saw that countdown coming from, the 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, etc. Think of the global or world ages in Rise and Fall as chapters in a book. And every chapter in a good book has its own subplot, right? You're pursuing objectives that are unique to that moment in your story. This is exactly how Rise and Fall treats the ages of history. Civilizations that excel during each age can earn golden ages. So when you do well in a particular chapter, you can have some rewards in the next chapter. Civilizations that suffer too many setbacks can slip into dark ages. And there is such a thing as a heroic age, ladies and gentlemen, as I've mentioned before, which we will talk about momentarily. Now, before I say anything else, the first thing you should know about falling into a dark age because Dark Ages are new. Golden Ages were in previous Civilization titles. Dark Ages are a bit fresher for those of us that have been following the series for a while. When Rise and Fall was still in development, the team at Firaxis was having so much fun playing through Dark Ages. I'm not misspeaking. They were having fun playing through Dark Ages that they actively adjusted the game's rules to ensure that Dark Ages weren't too easily avoided. Again, because they were having fun. Not because they wanted to be sadists and make everyone be in Dark Ages more often, but because they were having fun during the Dark Ages and they didn't want the unique elements of Dark Age gameplay to be underappreciated by people. So what I hope you're taking away from my explaining that little anecdote is that you shouldn't see a Dark Age as a game over or a rage quit moment where you're just like, oh, got a Dark Age. I'm not going to win now. If you play your cards right, there are ways that falling into a Dark Age can help you win the game. And I'm not just talking about a heroic age. There are a few different ways that it can help you. So how is your excellence during each era tracked, you might be wondering. Or maybe you're not wondering because you've been paying attention. It's tracked via era score, which is shown down here at the bottom. And this tooltip is also very useful because it shows us the uh, thresholds for each age type that are important. So we have a current era score and it will fill up this meter here. This is earned by achieving historic moments. And we've been earning these throughout the campaign. We earned some last episode when we founded a religion. Each historic moment can add a small or large amount of error score to your current ages total. So when we go to our history timeline, we can go back to the beginning and see everything that has given us error score and how it's happened. For this reason, I'm actually not going to go into too much detail on the types of things that can give you error score. 
because you've already been learning simply by watching the series to this point. How about that? So by virtue of reaching the classical age, we, we didn't fall into a dark age, but we didn't achieve the golden age threshold either. So we are in the classical age in a normal state, which we were in the beginning of the ancient age. You'll always begin the ancient age in a normal age. And we are continuing status quo because we didn't necessarily pursue a golden age. But I think it might be nice to maybe try and pursue a golden age for the next age, the medieval age, after this one. So we will very likely be doing that in this series. So just a few examples, though, of some historic moments that we haven't seen with big era score bonuses. You could be the first to discover a natural wonder. You could be the first to circumnavigate the world. That's actually one we definitely haven't seen. You get more points for that than we've seen for anything so far. Also, building or producing one of your civilization's uniques. So if we built the ziggurats, we would have gotten a little bit more era score. Uh, clearing a barbarian encampment that was close enough to pose a major threat to one of your cities is also a way to earn a larger amount of uh, era score, which we have also seen in the series so far. So with each era, as you can see, you face a threshold which you must pass in order to avoid a Dark Age. When you continue past that for a sufficient number of points, you will trigger a Golden Age. If you manage to achieve the Golden Age threshold while in a Dark Age, you will trigger a Heroic Age. Let me say that again. If you manage to achieve the Golden Age threshold while in a Dark Age, if you're in a Dark Age, you get all the way to the Normal Threshold and then all the way to the Golden Threshold, you get a Heroic Age. So the Threshold for Golden Ages will increase with each Golden Age, so it's hard to chain them. So every time you hit a Golden Age, the next era trying to earn your way through the the era score wheel, so to speak, or the, the circle, sphere, whatever you want to call it, earning your way through this meter will be harder for you. It is possible to chain Golden Ages, especially if you know what you're doing, but it becomes harder and harder the more you've done in a row. And when you have a Dark Age, it's actually, it becomes easier to achieve the next Golden Age. So it's dynamically monitored by the game. And by the way, the amount of time spent in each world age is kind of tracked. As you can see here, we have 26 to 40 turns. Anywhere from 26, a minimum of 26 to a maximum of 40 turns are going to pass before the world enters the medieval era. The game is tracking a whole bunch of things as predictors for when this will actually enter into a countdown from 10 down to zero. So right now, it's kind of a flexible window. You can know in general how much longer you have, but until the game is ready to say we're down to 10 turns, you won't know specifically how long it's going to be until the world enters the next era. The game, again, follows a whole lot of different variables to make sure that that is um, all properly calculated behind the scenes. At the beginning of each age, you will have the opportunity to choose a dedication. Let's go ahead and look at this finally. So this is what you see when you enter into a new era. You're in a, we are in a normal age, of course. It looks like Frederick is in a dark age, sad to say, which means he might get a heroic age if he's lucky next, um, next time we transition. So when we hit the medieval age, Cleopatra is in a normal age. And there are three, of course, unmet players. You are in a normal age during the game era. Each of your citizens exerts the normal amount of loyalty pressure in their city. This pressure also affects other cities within nine tiles, but is 10% less effective per tile. We've learned that already. You may make a dedication, which will provide an additional source of era score during the age. So let's take a look at what those actually are. So dedications last for the entirety of the ensuing age. Once chosen, you are stuck with them until the next age begins. For Golden and Heroic Age civilizations, what you'll see are, they, they'll be under the same names, but rather than being era score boosts as these are, they're gameplay bonuses that can bolster you in significant ways as a reward for your achieving a Golden or Heroic Age. For Normal and Dark Age civilizations, like these choices, they're the same choices, but they have different descriptions, different content. So everything, like if we had a golden age right now, we would still see free inquiry, but it would actually be a bonus, an actual benefit to our civilization, not to our era score, something that's bolstering our science output. For instance, monumentality for golden age civilizations bolsters your ability to build your civilization up quickly. You can actually buy settlers and builders with faith when you have the monumentality dedication in a golden age. But again, for normal and dark age civilizations, these are bonuses to era score. 
so they accompany certain styles of gameplay. Think of this as your chance to make the game reward you for pursuing the goals in this next chapter that you are most interested in pursuing. So the next age of the game that you're going to enter into, you get to say to the game, you know, I have a feeling that I'm going to need to catch up in science, so I'm already going to be working on that. Let me have you reward me for pursuing science-related goals, which is pretty nice. You get plus one error score every time you get a Eureka and plus one error score for constructing a building that provides science as a base yield. So as long as you are sincerely pursuing that goal, as long as you know that's what you're going to focus on, you will have the opportunity to have the game kind of give you points for that more than the other players are getting, and you have a slightly easier chance at getting a golden age, which is really pretty nice. You will always have to choose one of these four options, and these will gradually evolve and change over time, so these will not always be there. Monumentality will eventually go away. But you will always get to choose one from among the four. However, if you wanted to know what Heroic Ages were, they also only get to choose one, but the difference <laughs> is they are choosing the one that they don't get. Heroic Age civilizations actually get to choose three of the four dedications, which is insane. So for an entire age, you get some crazy bonuses to your civilization's gameplay. So one thing I have not talked about so far, well, before I talk about that, let's let's make a dedication really quickly, shall we? So we're doing pretty well in science and culture, I think. Uh, we can do monumentality, so we get extra error score for each time we get a new specialty district built, and we are going to be pursuing specialty districts, or we can go for Exodus of the Evangelists. And this will allow us, it looks like Ur is not following our religion currently, so we get two error score each time we convert a city to our founded religion. So if we're about to found two more cities and we have to convert all of them, that's six error score right there, which we would get for what we already have in, in motion. Whereas monumentality, we would have to build six different specialty districts in order to get that equivalent. I think we're more likely to benefit from Exodus of the Evangelists since we just founded a religion. Let's confirm that, and we now have that bonus. Notice Zoroastrianism is the dominant religion in Uruk, but not in Ur, which is why I was kind of excited about that. So one last thing to mention before I close out this episode, I do want to focus just on this topic for this one, so we have a bit of a shorter one. Golden, Heroic, and Dark Ages have a specific and very important impact on the loyalty mechanics we talked about in a recent video. And it's a very important change in mechanics to understand, which is that when you are in a heroic or golden age, loyalty goes up to 1.5 loyalty per citizen. So your citizens exert more loyalty pressure, and it is easier to convert other cities to your culture, especially if they're in a dark age, because dark ages have 0.5 loyalty per citizen. It gets cut in half. Again, if you're in the capital, you still have the extra one loyalty point, so it would be 1.5 loyalty per capital citizen. But these Dark Ages do affect loyalty pretty substantially. Another thing that affects loyalty is religion, by the way, now that we've talked about all those topics. When you have your city following your religion, let's take a look at the loyalty tab real quick and you'll see what I mean. Because Uruk is following our founded religion, we get three additional loyalty per turn. Not loyalty pressure, but loyalty per turn. Again, loyalty pressure is just based on citizens. So one last thing. Dark Ages allow for special policies, too, that will require you to make painful sacrifices for powerful bonuses. So when I talk about how Dark Ages can be fun to play through, this is exactly what I mean. You get these very unique, they're completely black cards that you choose, and we can't see them right now. We might see them later on if we get a Dark Age. And one example, if you want to know what I'm talking about, is there is a policy that gives you a huge combat bonus while taking away the ability for your units to heal and recover hit points outside of your territory. So you get a big boost to your damage dealing capability. So if you want to go on the warpath and conquer other cities and earn era score that way to get your golden age so you can score a heroic age coming out of a dark age, <laughs> hope that sentence made sense to you after watching this episode. If you want to do that, you can select that policy when you have a when it's time to change your government up and you only have it during a Dark Age, but you get a massive combat boost as long as you are confident enough with your army that you can do that kind of damage without needing to heal your units far away from your own territory. It's pretty cool stuff. So, starting with the next episode, we're going to spend a few episodes 
That's right, we're going to actually take a few episodes to cover one general area, which is diplomacy in depth. We're going to finally go back to these screens and talk more about interacting with other leaders before we get too much later in the game. The different kinds of things that you can learn from looking at this screen and all of its various tabs. And we will also talk about trade agreements and some of the other things that you can do in that particular situation. We also will talk about leader opinions and agendas, finally. That's one of the first things we'll cover, to tell you the truth. So again, that topic is coming up for the next few videos. I'm excited to cover that. Hope you are as well. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this one, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to follow along. New episodes are coming out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 a.m. Eastern Time. Comments are always welcome. Let me know what you think, and I will see you next time.